with the Professional VMware.com B Brown Bag US Edition. Tonight we have Anthony Elizondo on to talk about latency sensitive apps. Um, a few quick notes before we get started. If I know how to work PowerPoint, there we go. Uh, feel free to follow along uh, in the conversation on Twitter at using the hashtag V Brown Bag. You can also follow the V uh, Brown Bag Twitter accounts around the world. We have at B Brown Bag, at B Brown Bag Latam, and at B Brown Bag EMEA. Uh, we have a number of different shows. Uh, we've got Asia Pacific, that's every other Thursday. We've got EMEA, which is Tuesdays. Latin America, which is Spanish speaking on Thursdays. And then, of course, this US show every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Central. Again, my name is Damian Carlson. I'm at Six of Dad on Twitter. We have Anthony Elizondo. He is at Complex on Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to tweet the hashtag, uh, tweet either myself or at the Brown Bag or Anthony, uh, or you can also raise your hand or shoot a question within the GoToWebinar interface. So that being said, I will now turn it over to you, Anthony, and make you presenter. All right. If I were faster at this, you would already have it. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, there you are, sir. Let's see. And there we go. I see your OSX desktop with uh, VoIP on vSphere. OK. Um, show main screen. OK. Sweet. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anthony Elizondo. Uh, as Damien said, I'm, I'm uh, at Complex on Twitter. And uh, today I'll be talking um, uh, a little bit about VoIP, but mostly uh, just generally about latency-sensitive applications um, on vSphere. And that's uh, when we get near the middle of the talk, we'll kind of uh, draw a line. You know, uh, even though most people will consider VoIP latency-sensitive um, to VMware, perhaps uh, it it really isn't. So um, we'll we'll get to that distinction uh, in a little bit. So uh, first, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a senior virtualization engineer at Bloomberg uh, in New York City. And these are some of the places uh, I've worked at before. Um, as Damien said, you can uh, you know, uh, at me on Twitter or just, uh, use, use a tag, and we can pick up questions um, that way. I'll also say that uh, I have given this presentation bef uh, before pretty much in the same form uh, to uh, New York City VMUG uh, at the end of last year. So not sure if anyone is listening now who was there then. But So what is, what is VoIP for, for people who might not be uh, familiar with it? It's making phone calls uh, over the internet. And it's when people say VoIP, they primarily mean SIP. And what is what is SIP? SIP is um, a messaging protocol that handles uh, the setup of the call um, and uh, allows for a secondary channel, what most people call the audio stream or the RTP stream, um, for actually carrying your voice. Um, so when you say a VoIP call, it's actually two different forms of, of communication. The, the SIP call setup is actually very much like a web server um, in that uh, the SIP messaging codes are just like HTTP codes. Right? If you see a 404, that's not found right? in HTTP. It's the same way in, in SIP. In SIP, you can get a 404 if someone's endpoint or is off or the phone is not connected or something. Uh, if you get a 200 OK in HTTP, that means you load the web page OK. In SIP, it means the uh, call is connected. Right? So this SIP call setup uh, bullet point here in the middle, just think of that as a web server. And 
as we should know already, VMware, you know, virtualization is really good at virtualizing web servers. Web servers are not a hard problem for, for ESX. The third bullet point is, is RTP, and this is a, a little trickier. Right? An RTP stream is your actual voice, and uh, it's sent over UDP. It's highly sensitive to interruptions in network delays. Right? If you have 200 millisecond delay on a web page, most people can't really detect that. Right? That's kind of nearing the edge of when you start thinking this page is slow. Um, below that, you can't really tell. But 200 millisecond delay on audio is pretty detectable by uh, by a lot of people. Um, also, the the um, RTP stream needs to be uh, now, his latency is not is only one thing, but there's also uh, a, another uh, element of network quality known as jitter. And jitter is the variability of these packets. An RTP stream needs to be needs to send UDP packets at a regular interval, every say 20 milliseconds, every 40 milliseconds. And if some packets are delayed and some are on time, or you know, uh, just there's the a variability in the gap between these packets, then you can hear that very easily. Um, if you ever if you're on a VoIP call and you, and you hear someone and you hear someone complaining that they sound like they're underwater or they sound like a robot, um, that's usually uh, jitter in the call. Right, the, the the robot sound might still be on time. There's not a lot, there's not a lot of delay, but uh, the quality of the call is severely impacted. Anthony, uh, your audio is a bit fuzzy. Totally ironic. <laughs> is, that, is, yeah. is, is that a little better? Yes, yes, it's a bit clearer. Thank you. OK. Um, so uh, this is just a quick diagram pulled from uh, some Cisco documentation about what call flow might look like. Um, on the left, you have a phone. Uh, you have it connected to a PBX, but this isn't strictly necessary. Um, so this, this, is, this would be the PSD inside. And on the right side is a, a SIP phone. So this SIP phone connects through some IP network. It could be the internet. It could be a local network. And it connects to a, a gateway. Um, this diagram just shows that there's this, this first part that's all the way above the, bottom, above the data line. These are all SIP invite message. This is an invite message. You can see a 200 OK. And you can see acts back and forth. And once once the call is set up, then you have a UDP stream that is sent back and forth, and then and a goodbye. Um, I guess, this is, I mean, I, I included this just to show how, uh, again, the of what call is really two, it's two totally different types of network traffic. So here are the, the enemies of, of VoIP. Um, this is when we're talking about the quality of the network. Um, first is bandwidth. Bandwidth, uh, to be frank, is not really a problem anymore. Uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago it, it was, but these days we have sufficient bandwidth everywhere. We have you know, uh, on the order of 15 megabits, 20 megabits to your phone you know, over LTE, you have um, just gobs of bandwidth everywhere. Uh, decent, uh, decent VoIP call needs about 20 to 80 kilobits per second. So that's that's nothing, right? That's uh, easily achievable by many kinds of networks today. The second part is latency. Latency is is, is just that it's a delay in the packets. Uh, this is acceptable to um, to a lot of people. Uh, you know, if you've ever made an international call, there's a lot of latency there. That's not VoIP specific, specific. It's just speed of light specific, right? It needs to go a far distance. Most people can deal with a lot of latency, and that's not really a problem. Um, packet loss is a problem, right? Uh, uh, packet loss is when a UDP packet is completely dropped, gets sent from 
the source and the receiver never gets it. Uh, you know, what VoIP, um, a lot of VoIP codecs have ways to adjust for this. Um, you know, in the encoding, there can be uh, overlapping uh, data so that a one loss packet uh, may not mean that much data loss, but in the end, there is going to be some, right? There's only so much um, making up it can do. And the last one is, is jitter. And jitter, as I said before, is just the variance in packet delivery. Um, so so how, do we, how do we adjust for jitter? Well, one of the, the easiest techniques is to perform a trade-off. Uh, and the trade-off is we can increase the latency uh, in order to uh, kind of cover up any jitter that's happening. So let's say you're trying to send a, a packet, a UDP packet, an RDP packet, every 20 milliseconds. And by the time it reaches the receiver, some of the packets are 20 milliseconds apart, some are 21, some are 22, some are 25 milliseconds apart, some are 30 milliseconds apart. If you just play that stream as it is, it, it wouldn't sound very good. But the solution is we can add a buffer, right? So if you added a buffer, say you um, allowed for 20 to 25 milliseconds uh, per packet. So the ones that were 20 were great. Um, you just added an extra five milliseconds to those. And the ones that were 25 milliseconds, they're a little late, but they're still within your window and you just play them as is. And so everything uh, to the user sounds great. Even though you might have some jitter on the line, if you allow for an extra five milliseconds of latency, then um, the receiver can put these packets in order and add that five milliseconds if needed and everything's still great. Um, uh, what I mentioned about latency before, um, the ITU, the International Telephone Union, says that in order to maintain good voice quality, uh, latency should be under 150 milliseconds uh, one way. So what that's just saying is you kind of have 150 milliseconds to play with. If, if you're calling New York to Los Angeles, that's, what, 60 milliseconds um, out of the box. So you could add another 30 milliseconds and people wouldn't really notice. And uh, this is just a um, uh, another diagram um, of a Cisco, uh, uh, kind of a standard Cisco uh, rollout of, of uh, a SIP platform. And really what I just want to show is that um, here is a, a proxy server. And uh, a proxy server in in a VoIP platform in SIP speak is really just uh, a web server, right? This proxy server is just speaking, you could say it's speaking HTTP, uh, you know, like uh, traffic. So it's speaking SIP, but it's like a web server. And again, we have no problem virtualizing these things. And here's a, another proxy server. Uh, again, this proxy server has, uh, it's, it's a web server, so there's no problem. The, the tricky part is is sending um, the audio stream, and the audio stream uh, isn't well depicted in this picture, but really it needs to go from endpoints, uh, phones, to a gateway, to this SIP PBX gateway. Right? It needs to take, this is really where uh, an RTP stream over IP traffic is converted to PSTN type traffic. So you're, you're the stream, the uh, UDP, RDP stream needs to get to this gateway. Um, today, all of these gateways run in software, right? This isn't, in this picture, it's a dedicated Cisco 3725, but um, it, could, it could just as well be an asterisk box. Um, these things are running more and more in software, uh, more, a lot more than 10 years ago, and, and why is that? It's because a lot of the need to interconnect to the PSTN to, to normal old PBXs is, is re, you know, vastly reduced. Um, these days, you, you would run this on an asterisk box, and, and it, your endpoint could be a laptop, could be a SIP phone. But when it gets to this gateway, it no longer needs a PRI card. This is a, 
old school PSTN uh, line card. Instead of connecting over a PRI card to some piece of hardware, it, this gateway might actually just connect to a SIP provider directly and, and forward the RTP stream you know, off. So this gateway is less, these days less a piece of hardware and it's more um, another just generic server right? that just has a network connection. And that means people are virtualizing these things. But it also means that um, RTP traffic is being run in virtual machines more often uh, than before. So uh, with that uh, kind of SIP stuff, WIP stuff covered, we'll talk about um, network I.O. in, in vSphere. Um, if you're running your your SIP proxy and your um, gateway in in a virtual machine, then all this uh, all this traffic, all your voice traffic, is is passing through um, a physical network card and and a virtual network card, right? So these are all the things that you have to contend with. These are all the the kind of steps that you have to go through to process a a single I/O packet to send a packet on um, on a VNet, right? So e each one of these steps um, introduces uh, greater latency and opens up the opportunity for uh, to introduce jitter. Um, so this is where we, we kind of uh, draw the line. Even though I talked a lot about VoIP, um, it's actually not that bad, um, meaning, so all the latency, um, the latency numbers I quoted before were in terms of milliseconds, right? We, we talk 10 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds for a SIP call. Well, even though you have all these layers to go through in network I.O. Uh, in vSphere, the, the overhead of all these things, um, you know, the emulation overhead, processing a packet, uh, only adds about 20 microseconds to the processing time of the packet. Like 20 microseconds, that's a whole order of magnitude away from, from milliseconds. So actually these things don't really cause a lot of problems, overhead and packet processing. The, the problem can arise in uh, scheduling and interrupt because these things just these things are not just adding 20 microseconds latency. These things are introducing variability. Right? They're introducing jitter. Um, so this is where these are the things you would want to focus on um, in reducing latency, uh, in reducing in, in increasing network I/O in in vSphere. So. Um, this is just uh, kind of going back to slides. This is just talking about the things that you would that you would be virtualizing uh, in in vSphere. Again, a proxy is easy. Uh, a gateway is if you connect it to a, a PSTN. There's one other part I didn't mention. This is a, a media relay. This is really just a a UDP forwarder. It accepts UDP streams and it forwards them on to some other place. You might need this if you need to get around uh, NAT. You would need this if you um, were a, a carrier grade or a, you know public service telephone company uh, where you needed to uh, adhere to laws for you know, federal intercept because you have to capture all these streams. You can't allow you can't allow an endpoint uh, someone's phone talk to, talk directly to someone's phone because if the FBI or someone comes, you know you have to be able to say. Uh, I can I can capture this um, capture that stream um, kind of like you know tapping a phone. So uh, a media relay is uh, sending the UDP stream, so it's highly jitter um, sensitive. A proxy, not so much. Um, so how do we how do we reduce this variability and and really, it comes down to optimizing the hardware for 
um, to, to remove these opportunities of um, interruption, right? We all know that VMware is about sharing resources that you can oversubscribe, you can have 40 VMs on one piece of hardware, but for to absolutely reduce the opportunity for latency, you'll find that uh, we want to uh, preempt preemption. Right? We want to stop preempting from happening. And what that means is uh, drawing stronger boundaries between all these sharing. And so the first thing is um, you want to disable uh, power management, say, on your server. Right? You want to disable C states, disable power saving. Um, power saving can result in um, you know, PSU, uh, power supply, uh, power variability, which, which results in CPU variability, and all that kind of variability is bad. Um, you know, you'll see this in a lot of standard um, VMware tuning recommendations for high performance. Uh, so the next thing is uh, eliminating layers, and that's by using SRIOV. Um, when I give this talk in, in, uh, at VMUG, I ask how many people use SRIOV, and I think in a room of, of 50 or 60 people, um, there was only two hands that went up, and, and one of the hands was a VMware employee, so it's, it's, very, it's very rare. Um, what is SRIOV? It's, it stands for single root, single root I.O. virtualization, and um, it allows one device to appear as multiple devices kind of directly to a virtual machine. So this is taking, say, a 10 gig NIC, and with SIOV it can appear as 10 10 gig NICs or 40 10 gig NICs and be presented directly to a virtual machine. Um, this SRIOV was, was not created by, by, by VMware. Oops, sorry. It wasn't created by VMware. Uh, it was created by the uh, PCI SIG, uh, I think it's Special Interest Group. So it, it is intended for you know, virtualization. That's what, that's what the V is. But it's, um, people realize the need for this uh, before, before VMware, um, I guess. Um, so this is available for lots of people. In fact, if uh, if anyone's familiar with EC2 and you look at, um, I think they're M2 in, M instances or I2 instances. I forget which ones. Uh, those are ones that are intended for high throughput uh, networking, um, either out you know either outside of EC2, but mostly internal. Uh, people have these beefy EC2 boxes and they want to be able to talk to each other over a 10 gig interface very, very quickly, right? Um, for in-memory databases or something like that. So Amazon offers, um, I forget what Amazon calls them exactly, but they're, they're for high throughput. And uh, EC2 uses Zen, and, and Zen is leveraging SRIOV. Uh, in each of those boxes, EC2, in each of those uh, physical servers that Amazon has, they have uh, an Intel 10 gig NIC that, that, top, that supports SRIOV, and they virtualize the, the NIC and present it directly to the VM. And uh, that just removes one layer uh, you know, that the VM has to talk on. It, it gives the VM direct access to this hardware, and uh, it will prevent some preemption. Um, you do have increased CPU usage, but uh, for most people, that's an acceptable trade-off, right, to uh, use up the CPU uh, in exchange for lower latency and lower jitter. Um, in 5.5, uh, VMware gave us some nice, uh, a nice uh, option, and it's a single, it's a single checkbox with, uh, I believe it's three options, and it, it's just called the latency option. So if you turn this to, what it does is, it uh, when you change this flag on a virtual machine, uh, it sets a few different options. Um, all in the goal of reducing uh, latency and reducing preemption and thus jitter. So when you set this flag to high, what you're really doing is um, creating an exclusive reservation on uh, a physical CPU. 
it's it's um, analogous to if you took a uh, if you had a machine that had ten physical cores and you had ten uh, virtual machines with one virtual CPU each, and you set a reservation for for each of those cores, um, and what it, what what that means, of course, is that no other VM is going to come along, um, and not even any uh, VM kernel threads are going to come along and and have the possibility of interrupting that that VM. You know, what it, uh, it also I and mean, what that means is if you have 10 cores and you set this latency flag on 10 virtual machines, that's the most virtual machines you're going to be putting on that machine, right? You're out of resources. Um, you're done. Uh, setting this flag also places a full reservation for all the memory of the virtual machine. Right? So uh, again, this is, you're not going to be able to, if you set this flag on every VM on your physical host, you won't be able to uh, overcommit memory. Um, even more than that, uh, the VM can no longer be ballooned, right? What's, uh, hopefully everyone knows what ballooning is, but, but just quickly, ballooning is what the host can do to, um, to reclaim some resources from a VM if the host needs to give it to someone else. Well, any, anything the host does to the virtual machine of that nature, right, like inflating the balloon is, is going to be unexpected to the VM and it's probably going to, um, it has the possibility of, of impacting anything running in the VM. So no, no ballooning. Um, so if the host is under memory pressure, the VMs that have this flag set uh, will not be subject to normal host level memory reclamation techniques. Um, it also gives the, the, when you set this flag, it also gives the virtual machine um, direct access to uh, the VMM, the virtual machine monitor, for each vCPU. Uh, what that means is it gives, it kind of gives it a shortcut past the normal ESXi CPU scheduler. And, and why not, right? Since, since you're giving it a, a reservation to a physical CPU, there's not a chance of it being interrupted by anyone else. So doesn't have to be subject to um, the normal CPU scheduler. Um, the, the last thing is um, when you set this flag, if, uh, if you're using um, VMXNet3 interfaces, it will automatically disable uh, VNIC interrupt coalescing uh, and LRO, which is a large receive offload. These these types of things um, are normally meant to save CPU, right? Uh, you can offload. Um, what, what LRO does is if you're moving a lot of bandwidth, if you have a high bandwidth uh, stream, it aggregates packets, uh, smaller packets into larger packets before passing them up the stack. And uh, that, that saves CPU time. In this case, that would be bad for us, right? Uh, taking all our small RTV packets and, and batching them up and sending it out is the opposite of what we want. We want a, a, a nice, smooth, consistent stream. If we batch them up, uh, that's artificial jitter. So when you set this flag, uh, you're turning off a uh, large receive offload. Um, again, you're going to increase CPU, but uh, your um, reducing the chance of jitter being introduced. Um, so, so all these things are, uh, all the things I talked about in this slide are, you know, easily, the, it, it's, what's, what's great about this is you can just check this one flag. And as long as you understand all the things it's really doing, um, it's great. You know, uh, before, I think before 5.5 five to to, you, you could do a lot of the same things. You could set a reservation for each one and, and set a reservation for memory. Um, and, but but it, was just, it was a manual process, right? This is, um, this is an easy way to tell ESX, treat this VM special and don't let other things interrupt it. Um, 
so going to the next slide, I, I will say that um, all these things that VMware has a great white paper that explains uh, the things I talked about in the last slide about setting that latency flag. Um, you'll notice that in the paper, it I don't think it mentions um, millisecond probably even once. So what it means is these latency things are, these turning on this flag is for applications that are microsecond um, sensitive. Uh, and and to be honest, VoIP really isn't isn't like that, right? Uh, in fact, uh, I talked to um, one of the PMs for the latency sensitive feature, and he said that you know VoIP is, is frankly it's a solved problem. Uh, this this flag is not for VoIP things; it's for things even more sensitive than that. Uh, VoIP runs just fine um, with without any special settings, and that's you know I really that was really confirmed by a lot of people I talked to. They ran. Uh, full Cisco um, unified communication, you know, a lot of asterisk things, a lot of um, streaming, uh, not only VoIP streaming audio, but streaming video, and those things are 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 fine in vanilla VMware. Uh, this flag is for for things that are more sensitive than that. Um, so. Um, as, as I just said, uh, VoIP really isn't isn't a problem. Um, the, the engineers at, at VMware are working on things that are much harder. And you know, these types of things are in the financial world, in high performance computing, um, and uh, things that are uh, distributed in memory databases. As I said, so those are the types of problems that they want to. Um, make sure people don't have a problem virtualizing, right? Uh, I'd even say these things are kind of past uh, what a lot of people consider enterprise apps, right? Like databases, uh, the the PM at VMware said, you know, databases aren't really a problem either. So, so this is really for the highest end type stuff. Um, you know, I. Uh, I th so I mean that really covers most of the content I have. If anyone has any uh, questions, you can type them in the uh, in the question area. I do have at at, at VMUG I had a a giveaway where I gave away um, a signed copy of uh, Duncan and Frank's um, HA book, and I have I have a different giveaway this time. Um, if it's okay with Damien. Uh, I no, want to give away giving away things. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I want to give away a copy of um, uh, gosh, I forgot the name for it now. The the book that uh, Pernix um, you know, kind of commissioned the one that was full of tweets. Like yes, yes. I, I it's called the uh, vSphere Design Pocket Book. Yeah, design right now. Pocket book. Yep. Um, so I have a copy that's uh, signed by. Uh, Frank and Duncan and a bunch of other other contributors um, that I got at VMworld, and I want to want to give it away. Uh, so I have a quick like contest, if that's okay. So sure. The contest is this trivia question: Take the number of VMworlds um, that have happened in the U.S. Right, um, times the max number of hosts in a cluster in five five times the UDP port for DNS. Um, so take this number and text it to this phone number. Uh, this phone number is being hosted by Twilio, so I'll be able to open a, a window and we'll be able to uh, look at you know people uh, texting in their answer. Wow. Yeah. That's so, pretty crazy. <laughs> I was going to write a little more complicated app, but I, I didn't really have time. Um, this is also to celebrate. Uh, I just went over a thousand followers, people who just followed me just just now. So, thanks, B. Awesome. John Beck, listeners. You know, we do what we can, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so, the number of VM worlds in the U.S. times the number of max hosts in a cluster with uh, with vSphere five five 
times the UDP port for DNS texted to 732-4167-VMW. That is interesting. Um, I don't know any of these things. I'm actually looking it up on my own right now. I'm pretty sure it's greater than two, but less than 40 billion. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm rather certain. <laughs> so if we want, we can look. Um, this, this is uh, the API Explorer in Twilio. So um, really, I'm just, I'm, this is, this is a, I don't know if people are familiar with Twilio, but I've been involved in Byte for a long time, so it's, this is pretty awesome to me. So you can set up like apps that listen to things. You can write like games that talk SMS or even, uh, you know, all sorts of crazy telef telephony stuff. So what, I'm, what I did is I'm going to go to message and look at my message list and then see messages sent to this number. And I'll run and I'll hit make request and this is just going to show me, um, it should show me uh, texts that are coming into this phone number. So uh, this is the response going out. Hello, thanks for the message. But someone sent in 15900, which uh, I believe that's correct. So the, uh, you know, I don't want to give away the person's phone number, but it's, it's right here. So whoever's number and hey, you're actually giving it away, right? Will you yeah. show it on the screen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> whoever, whoever, uh, and number ends in zero two two three, um, you're the winner. How are you going to tell me who won? Uh, maybe I'll give you a call after the after the um, after the show. So All I right? had a different number than that. I had a higher number than that. Uh, what number did you have? So I had 53, which is the port, 32 hosts in a cluster, and 10 VM worlds US. Yeah. 16960. You know what? I did this in November, so you, you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to bust out Victor phone number person. <laughs> I have to bust out a calculator. <laughs> I mean, I have had a couple bourbons, but I would hope that it wouldn't uh, exclude me from being able to operate calculator, although, who knows. Yeah, you're right. It's 16960. Uh, I, I win. I Stuck apologize to that person. <laughs> so I'm not going to don't, – don't prank that person who got the answer wrong. Uh, instead, <laughs> I, will, I will look at this later, and I will find the person who sent it in first. So. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. I I could have given the prize away to the wrong person. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That would be your heartburn deal, if not mine. So it, it's really <laughs> awesome. Uh, I actually have a copy of the Least for Design Pocketbook, and I was going to give it away um, a while back until I opened it up and I saw that it said "To Damien, signed Frank." And I was like, "Damn it! I, I can't uh, really give that away." <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with him at the last VMworld US, and you know we're just kind of shooting the breeze there, and uh, and you know he he signed the book and handed it to me, and I didn't look at it until I think when I got back home. So yeah, uh, yeah. it's actually a really cool book. There's a a, a lot of folks that uh, that did it. If you folks haven't seen it, uh, Frank Denman, Duncan Epping, Cormac Hogan, Jason Nash, Vaughn Stewart, and many others. Dot dot dot. Uh, so. Uh, it's a pretty sweet book. It is a bunch of uh, vSphere tips formatted in kind of the uh, tweet form. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see Raymond Epping, Chris Wall, Andrea Myro, uh, tons of people for sure. Josh Rogers. Uh, I don't see Damian Carlson here probably because I didn't uh, do any of that. Hey, look, we've got Jonathan Kraft here, the brown bag man extraordinaire. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. It's a pretty awesome book. It's uh, worthwhile. Uh, you know, taking a look at it and kind of reading through. So, um, so uh, let's see. I've got a couple of questions in here. Man. I don't see. Um, any, yeah. I don't see any questions really on uh, on Twitter. 
I see some nice conversation though. That's good. Sure. I have a question here within the uh, the webinar chat that I'm going to okay. send to you as well as read. Uh, Joe asks, would it be applicable for larger environments where you have many concurrent streams, or would that be mitigated by a wider deployment, large number of smaller VMs? I'm not sure what that's referring to, Joe. Although that came in a few minutes ago, Anthony, if you recall what you're speaking about then. So, um, wider deployment, larger number of smaller VMs. So, um, and Joe, if you'd like, I can unmute you. Okay, so so he's actually talking about tweaking the VMs for reservations. Okay. Okay. Well, so the the question, I mean, the the idea would be, um, you know, at what point does does is the VM, uh, you know, too too busy? So, like I said, uh, imagine a hypothetical ESX host that had um, ten ten cores available, and you had ten VMs. They each had one vCPU, and you set them all to high latency, so they're all getting a reservation. You, know, you can't make any more VMs. That's that's the that's the end. That's the end of that host. It's it's full. I guess the question would be, uh, instead of having 10 one CPU VMs, what if you had five two CPU VMs? Uh, you know, I don't think that would be uh, any any better. Uh, then then you have the case of ESX has to get. Uh, Actually, I'm not sure you could do that at all, right? Uh, to, to make a two CPU v, a VM means that it would have to, it, it might have to span. Um, I guess you know two would be okay, but any larger it would have to span a uh, physical. Uh, it might have to span a uh, physical core, and and I don't I don't think the latency flag would let you do that. Um, so probably smaller VMs are going to be better. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, you know, there's some overhead of management, of course. You know, uh, but I don't think you're losing anything. You, you, whether you have big or small VMs, uh, I don't think you could handle more um, concurrent RTP streams. So, a follow-on question from Joe is: Are there ESX top metrics that would be more appropriate for voice over IP apps compared to regular ones? Uh, that's a good question. Um, trying to think of the columns that you see when you look in N uh, in ESX top. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, if you, what I do know is if you set this latency flag, uh, you should not see. Um, any co-stop time, right? A co-stop time is, is some other VM uh, taking cycles away from the VMs you care about. When you set this flag, you're bypassing the ESXi, ESXi scheduler. There is no other VM that's going to come along and co-stop your important VM. So that number should always be zero. Uh, so in terms of CPU time, you know that's that's what you can look for in in ESX top. Uh, in network, you know, I'd have to think about that. What uh, what columns would be important um, on that screen? So that's a good question. Um, so uh, some of the next questions there that I assigned you from Venkata and Graham. I see. The next question from Venkata is um, how do we calculate the required network bandwidth for VMs? Uh, assume you were doing a VMware infrastructure design. I know if you have, uh, I know we have 10 gig NICs, but uh, I need a formula or something to estimate the bandwidth. So the, the bandwidth for uh, a void call is is um, easily easily determined, uh, depending on on your codec. So um, in just adjust the screen.
I, I, you know, I haven't done this in so long when I used to work for a, a VoIP company, but uh, look what I just found. This is a VoIP bandwidth calculator. So uh, let's say your payload is G711, which is, it, it can, G711 is uh, an available voice codec, but you can see it runs at different bandwidth. Um, let's say you have a lot of bandwidth, and let's say 64 kilobits. Um, and this, this is the standard packetization um, interval, right, uh, to send uh, a packet every 20 milliseconds. And so you can see uh, this is, if you specify this bandwidth, this is easy. You, you know that if, if, the, if a voice call is running, it's going to use 64 kilobits per second, and you can just multiply this. Um, if you're using some some other Kodak uh, speaks or I, IRBC, you can see this is. Uh, you can even see like the overhead and stuff like that. Uh, I've actually never seen this calculator before. The enable sinus compression or um, RTCP, which is a RTCP is a. Um, it's kind of like a way to uh, collect statistics. So you can see when you turn the flag on. It's going to add a little some overhead. You know, this would be some flag you set in in UCS or asterisk that you want to collect statistics. Okay, then you have this extra um, bandwidth. So you could take this, multiply it by you know a hundred or a thousand, and look at the, the bandwidth. Now this is only for the RTP stream, but the RTP stream is going to be the majority of your bandwidth. Um, right? The the SIP messaging is like loading. A tiny web page or doing an HTTP GET, it's it's small compared to the RTP stream. Um, let's see. Uh, the next question is: We run SIP XCES as our VoIP system. Even writing zero out to local disk causes our registrations to drop. So he, he's saying I, I'm not familiar with this with this SIP uh, package. Yes. It's not good. So uh, Graham is saying uh, even writing zero out to local. So he's saying uh, if you write to disk, this is uh, causing uh, reliability problems in 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 the call, which should should definitely not be. Um, you know, that's like saying if I had if I had a web server. Uh, and you wrote, you know, you wrote some log. Um, you know, if you're writing a log file, th that means it would stop processing uh, web pages. That's that's kind of, you know, that's that's not really uh, acceptable. You know, uh, so there would definitely be some some other problems with the virtual machine. Uh, I would say. Uh, in in the example of a, a media relay, a media relay rarely has to even write to disk. It's a packet forwarder, right? These packets never never hit um, the disk subsystem, so it receives a packet, sends a packet out. Um, most most VoIP, uh, most things that process RTP don't write it to disk, unless the exception of you know you're doing some sort of call intercept or recording. Um, so without knowing too much more about the system, that just sounds, I mean, to me it sounds uh, there's a misconfiguration problem so, somewhere. I would look at, uh, you know, benchmarking that VM or looking at uh, what the application is doing because, uh, you know, any sort of disk access should not cause network interruptions. Uh, I think that covers most of the uh, existing questions. Yep, I assigned to you all of the ones I've gotten so far. Uh, so I also put a note out on Twitter um, underneath. Uh, see, how did I do that? Uh, yeah, I tweeted it from the at the Brown Bag account and hit up the hashtag the Brown Bag because 
I can social media, uh, and also put a, 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 a question there in the GoToWebinar chat. So if you folks have any other questions for Anthony, any comments, uh, what have you, feel free to shoot them over right now. Do, 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 do. I've actually thought about playing like, a, oh golly, who sings that song? Uh, to build this city, is that? Uh, anyhow, there's a there's a local morning radio show here in Austin that that does. Yeah, there we go. Starship, thanks, Joe. Uh, they do this thing where if they don't get anyone calling into the show, they just play "We Built the City" until people call in out of like sheer agony. <laughs> <laughs> I should do something like that, but maybe with something more modern and horrible, like Lady Gaga or Miley Cyrus or Colleen. What's a real crap artist these days. I don't know. I usually don't listen to the radio, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. A question from Vincata. Um, uh, Bieber. Good job, uh, Rob. Uh, so Vincata's question is, SR, IOV, can we use it for any other VCAC provisioning? So uh, SR, IOV, uh, you know, it doesn't really have too much to do with um, and vCloud or automation things. Uh, if we look at, um, well, uh, one thing I did forget to mention is uh, SRIOV requires a, a lot of hoops and has a lot of downsides. Um, if we look in this support fact, this is a KB. This is actually quite out of date, but it says what adapters are supported. It only lists a few here, two Intel cards, uh, two. You know, fit, uh, two families of Intel cards and Emulex, and that's it. You know, if you have to run one of these three types of cards, that's pretty limiting. Now, it turns out that this KB is actually somewhat out of date. If you go to vmware.com slash go slash HCL and go to network adapters and uh, tick the SRILV flag, there's a bunch more adapters, but it's still not a very common feature. Uh, it's becoming more common for sure. Um, when you when you when you have an SRIOV capable card and you and you and you turn this on, um, these are the things that you cannot do with SRIOV. So this is you know to most people, this is huge. Uh, imagine you can't V motion anymore. Imagine you, know, you can't use DRS. All these features go away when you enable SRIOV, which is probably one of the reasons why people don't turn it on. Um, so th this is, I mean, most people would look at this and say this is unacceptable to, to lose all this functionality that we're used to um, for increased performance. Other people who really need this performance would say that's okay. Um, basically going to not be able to do those things, um, you know, these nice things I used to. Um, but I'm going to get a VM that is going to scream uh, and it's going to get a lot closer to bare metal hardware than ever before. Um, so uh, back to the question, SRIOV doesn't really have anything to do with automation. It's merely a hardware specification that allows for uh, very direct access to uh, network devices. Yeah, it's a pretty cool technology for sure. Um, I used to work for a startup a while back that uh, due to SRIOV built into Intel network cards, uh, we could actually uh, virtualize uh, NICs directly on that adapter. So you could you know, present multiple 10 gig NIC card or NIC card or, you know, uh, <laughs> multiple 10 gig NICs off of one physical 10 gig NIC. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool technology for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, Dimkata, I hope that answers your question. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for Mr. Anthony? What's in here? Uh, Timothy has a question. Is SRIOV supported by the UCS VIX? A good question. Do you know off the top of your head? 
I, I don't know. And actually, someone asked me the same thing at that VMUG, and I didn't know. I, I'm not I'm not familiar with UCS, so uh, you know, UCS the server platform. Um, right. So I, I can't answer that. I say Are UCS server platform because. No, okay, because so UCS is also unified communication, whatever, from Cisco. Right, right. Um, looks like Tim Carr, or Timothy on Twitter, Tim here in the uh, webinar, uh, just said that it is supported. Is that correct, Timothy? And I can unmute you if you'd like. I'm sure your voice sounds better than mine. Anyhow, uh, while we're waiting on an answer from him, is there anyone else out there with a question? If not, uh, I think that we can wrap it up for the evening. Uh, Anthony, thanks for coming on the show. I absolutely appreciate it. Oh, thank and you. If you would like, yeah, absolutely. And if you out there would like to uh, present on the V Brown Bag, feel free to hit uh, myself up. I'm at six with that. You could hit up at V Brown Bag. You could hit up uh, John Frapp here. Oh my goodness, I feel terrible that I can't think of his Twitter account off the top of my head. I think it's actually Jay Frapier, F-R-A-P-P-I-E-R. Uh, let's see, Jared just responded on Twitter. Jared Bradford responded to Tim saying, yes, it is supported with a link to Cisco.com underneath the B Brown Bag hashtag. Uh, let's see, Jared and Joey both said good job, Anthony, so thank you very much. Uh, I'll just say, um, if you're interested in, you know, in speaking, um, it's not it's not hard. It's uh, you know if you have stage fright or something. It, I guess it is hard. But uh, I'm not. I don't think I'm very good at, at speaking. But I, what I am good at is uh, you know finding little nuggets of information. And everyone does this every day. You know you dig down into one problem and you you try and figure it out. And then you Google for it. And no one has anything. And then you think. You know, then you actually have to do some work, and then uh, you find something. And sometimes you find something that you know support told you uh, to do this one thing, and it really worked. Or you just fiddle with these flags, and and it got better. So everyone has a little something they can share. Uh, I'll just also say that um, this uh, this is you know the VMware user group, but there's a lot of people who want to help you, and I, I consider myself one of those people. So if you want to talk about some technical aspect on V Brown Bag, which is a great way to, uh, it's kind of a great warm up for VMware user group where, you know, I can talk to 30 of you people here and then talk to 60 people at a VMUG. Um, so use this hashtag feed forward or you can ask me or anyone who mentions this tag um, for speaking advice or just any questions you have in general. Thank you, and I agree. I actually know a number of folks uh, who speak in front of, of larger audiences, uh, you know, for their day job. And uh, what, what I've always kind of found interesting is that typically those folks who speak in front of the larger audiences are more cautious about going on to a podcast versus speaking live because the podcast is recorded and distributed globally versus, you know, what you say is live, and if you make a mistake, typically it's, it's not noticed, right? Um, I, on the other hand, find it different. I actually really like being on the podcast because I can have a drink and not wear any pants and say what I want <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of say, damn the torpedoes, versus being live when you actually have to smile and look people in the eye and, you know, not bore the hell out of people. So uh, all of that said, you know, we're always looking for presenters. Uh, the V Brown Bank is a community-supported organization, so... Anytime uh, you'd like to present, if you have something interesting, uh, feel free to hit us up, and we will gladly get you on the show. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you're blaming me for, Tom, early on Twitter, but I accept all the blames because I probably deserve it. Uh, <laughs> sorry, there's some shenanigans going on on Twitter right now uh, from Kyle Murley, who runs our Latin American show. Uh, so I don't, I, I'm not seeing uh, any other questions here, Anthony. So I think that about wraps it up for this evening. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks to everyone else for stopping by and listening to us jibber-jabber on this Wednesday night or whenever you're listening to us. 
um, join us next week. What well, it'll be? It'll be Wednesday, February 26th next week. And I'm not sure who we're going to have on. Let me take a look. Bear with me here. You can tell I'm I'm always very prepared, Anthony. Extraordinarily prepared would be not my middle name. <laughs> Let's see here. Hmm. It looks like we might have Mark Gabrielski on talking about uh, $2,000 home lab. I got to chat a bit with Mark uh, during Zoom where Partner Exchange last week, and he's got some good stuff planned there. So we'll confirm Mark for that, but as of right now, that's what we've got on the schedule for next week, the 26th. I'm totally interested so, in that. I need to rebuild my home lab and, uh, you know, of course, <laughs> want to do it cheap. Yeah, yeah, actually that's a really good discussion. I, I just, uh, well, not just, but a while back, I picked up a couple of those Intel notes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the little kind of uh, Apple yeah. Mac mini form factor that doesn't ship with any drives or memory or a uh, wireless network card. I picked up a couple i5s with 16 gigs of memory, and I think I spent about eight or nine hundred dollars. Where I completely failed to do the job was in the storage. Uh, I've, I've got some some NAS storage here, but it's more consumer based, and it just you know really couldn't handle uh, the VMware last kind of thing. I had a number of VMs kind of falling over dead, and there were a bunch of frustrations that that came out of that. So. Definitely, I would say that storage is as equally important as your hosts, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that we can talk about this more in depth next week. Right. Uh, and uh, I won't name the manufacturer of the home NAS that I have <laughs> because my employer might be upset. <laughs> so, uh, good times. So anyhow, thanks everyone. It's 8.30 p.m. Central, and it is time for me to go get some dinner. Uh, Anthony, thanks for your time, and everyone else, Thank thanks for stopping by.